Nana Bojo, Gije Anishnabe Nene, Gitash Noden, Indijnikas, Muskanoje, and Dodem. I appreciate the opportunity to be here and want to uh, do my best to ensure that this is time well spent uh, for all of you coming out this evening. I want to talk a little bit about wampum, and uh, we're just going to be able to have enough time to kind of dance across a few of them today. Um, but I thought that uh, in preparing for this evening, uh, I might be able to kind of lay some foundation for you. Not sure what your knowledge base is and all these kinds of things, but really wampum was about relationship, and it was about a way of securing relationship. It was, in a fancy word, a mnemonic device, a memory aid, a way of writing things down. And quite often what we're taught is that, you know, Indians, if I use that historic term, Indians didn't write stuff down, uh, which is wrong. It's historically and factually incorrect. And I think it comes at a time in history where indigenous peoples were being undermined and diminished for their intellectual capabilities, their intelligence. Uh, so there's a whole lot of real, real wonderful stories about all the different ways that indigenous peoples wrote stuff down. If you know about the petroglyphs carving in stone, if you know about pictograph, the painting on rock faces, if you know about birch bark scrolls, if you know about wampum, all different ways of writing things down. Wampum comes from two different kinds of shells. This is the quohog or quahog shell, and it is a eastern seaboard clam shell. There was a second shell that was used, I don't have an example here today, but it was called a whelk shell. And the whelk shell looks like, almost like your stereotypical seashell or conch shell. It was a white shell, and so that shell material was harvested and used for white beads. The purple comes from this quahog or quahog shell. And other than flowers across the eastern woodland, but this is the only place that you're going to find that purple coloration. And you can see that very little of the inside of the shell was actually purple. When they were harvested, their original intention was as a food source. And so we have a shell that's left over. And depending on the size of that shell then, it would have been used as some kind of tool or implement. I don't know the historical timeline, but at some point then, the people start manufacturing the shells into tubular beads. And so how did they do that? So before contact, there was no tool steel here in the eastern woodland. No hardened metal. So we think today that when this process started, that people would start to break up those shells into workable pieces probably find two flat river stones to begin to turn those fragments of shell into a cylinder shape, a tubular shape. Then to cut them to the certain length that they want. And then to figure out a way how to drill down through the center of the bead. So again, likely using a stone tool, a piece of flint, a piece of chert, very, very thin, and that was probably your drill. So you would hold the bead and you would start to drill down through the center. Try to imagine what it must have been like for those ancestors to sit down and manufacture beads. And then how long that may have taken. For the ancestors that were making wampum beads, they would have to sit by a shore, by a lake, by a creek, by a river, by a stream, by a small waterfall, and be constantly dunking the material so that dust would get washed away and that they would not inhale the dust. So then eventually, you're going to get the bathtub fingers, right? And then how much more difficult is it to do that with the big wrinkly fingers? But they figured out a way to do that. And they leave us with this legacy hundreds and hundreds of years later. I'm going to go back and maybe start even before where I had originally thought about. Um, and this first piece that I want to talk about is actually, well, when it was first taught to me, when I first started speaking about it, it was taught to me as an Iroquoian wampum. Um, I was eventually corrected on that, that it is not Iroquoian in its origin, it is specifically Mohawk. I'm Nishnabe, 
Uh, I have no right or authority or privilege to speak on behalf of the Mohawk Nation, to speak on behalf of the Confederacy, to speak on behalf of Longhouse. So please don't think that that's what my role here tonight is. If you want to learn those stories, you've got to go find a Mohawk person, a knowledge keeper, a ceremony keeper, those things. Or someone from the Confederacy or a person of Iroquoian ancestry to talk about that. So I'm going to share just a little bit about this one particular wampum because it's probably one of the ones that forms the foundation of these relationships between indigenous peoples and the newcomers. And that particular wampum is the two-row wampum. And so we can see it's kind of self-explanatory, yes? We have the white background of the wampum and the two purple paths represent one, the Mohawk Nation and the newcomers that arrived on the edge of their territory. And they understood very quickly, the people in the Mohawk Nation, that we're going to have to figure out how to coexist in peace with these newcomers. And so they are traveling down that life path together. It's kind of illustrated as a river of life. That the purple paths are the same size. That one is no greater, one is a little lesser than the other. That they travel parallel. They don't intersect and cross back and forth that one had no right or privilege to cross over into the other's vessel and tell them how to conduct the affairs of their world. So there was balance. They were equals. Now there's a whole lot more there uh, because of time constraints this evening and because I'm not a Mohawk person. And we're just going to share that little bit with you. So there's a number of wampum that come through, but in relation to 1812 and the talk we're going to hear this evening, I really kind of wanted to focus on belts connected to the British and their presence in the territories. I'm going to ask if I can get four helpers to come on up uh, and we'll, we'll start with this kind of British thing. Any four, don't be shy. This is from the Treaty of Fort Niagara of 1764. That previous to this, a handful of years, that the territory that we would be sitting in was New France. That the French were the colonial body, group, I hate to say authority, don't like that word, okay, or governance system, don't like that word either. Um, but they had a presence here and this was referred to as New France. I don't know if you're great with history or not, but just keep one thing in mind if you're not so great at history especially Western European history, all you have to do is remember that the British or the English and the French are always going to war. So they go to war here. Eventually the British, in the history books, it talks about lay the French on their back, that they defeat the French. The British arrive and they're quite full of themselves because they've just defeated their longtime enemy, the French. And when they get here, they disregard all the diplomacy that has been going on in the Eastern Woodland for a very long time. Probably from about the time that Champlain arrives and then everyone that kind of follows in his footsteps. So from those early 1600s right up to middle 1700s, a long time. They disregard all of that. And it's like, no, we're gonna do things the British way. So that leads to a lot of conflict for a whole bunch of reasons, all right? And if again, if I kind of kind of skip through history a little bit, it eventually leads to this thing called the Pontiac, well, it's called three things in the history books, the Pontiac Rebellion, the Pontiac Uprising, the Pontiac War. Pontiac was a mid-level Odawa nation chief, and he's really, really frustrated and angry with the British. And so he decides to put a plan together to attack the fort in the place where he's living, which is Detroit, Detroit, Windsor area. So we're going to show the British that we mean business. And so we're going to attack the fort, take the fort. Windsor, Detroit's kind of like way down there and almost due north where Lake Huron meets Lake Michigan. There's a place called Michilimackinac. Sometimes they call the Straits of Mackinac or just Mackinac. The place of the great turtle is what that word means in the language. There's a fort there. And like the fort at Detroit that was once held by the French, now held by the British, the fort way up north at Michilimackinac was once held by the French and is now held by the British. He sends wampum to his relatives there. And he says, I want you to attack the fort. 
We're going to attack the fort of Detroit. You attack it up there. We're going to let the British know that we mean business. And again, I don't know how many of you are historians or historical buffs, or if you've heard the story about what happens at Michilimackinac. You know how they attack the fort and they take the fort. Do you know how they do it? Through a game of lacrosse. Pontiac is not successful at Detroit. He lays siege to the fort, so they surround it. They stop them from doing business. The fort is taken at Michilimackinac. So this is a tremendous embarrassment for the British. About a year later, we get this thing called the Royal Proclamation of 1763, where the king unilaterally draws up a doc. Well, he probably didn't do it himself. He probably had someone else write it out, right? But he makes this decree about how Indian lands are to be disposed of. And depending on which perspective you have, from an indigenous perspective, he recognizes indigenous nations as sovereign nations. So there's something that we also need to learn about is the Royal Proclamation of 1763. In 1764, this man, Sir William Johnson, is dispatched. Because after all the other communities hear about Pontiac down at Detroit and what took place at Michilimackinac, word spreads through the Eastern Woodland, through Anishinaabe communities. And somewhere around three quarters of the British forts and outposts are either burned to the ground or laid siege to. And the British advance here is stopped in their tracks by Anishinaabe nations. So Sir William Johnson is dispatched. July and August of 1764, there's a conference of peace at Fort Niagara. It's across the river from where modern day Niagara on the lake is today. Back then it was British territory, now it's an American, it's American territory. And in that conference of peace, 24 nations from across the Eastern Woodland attend. And this is the wampum that the British present to those 24 nations to mark the Treaty of Fort Niagara. So in the middle, we see the two human forms, yes? In the language of wampum, the symbols of wampum, whenever we see two human beings holding hands, hand of friendship, hand of cooperation, hand of support, helping each other out. In the historical record, we see the bead above and the bead below. So not only were they holding on to each other's hands, their hands were bound with wampum to make the union even more stronger. And so when we look at the human forms, are they the same or are they different? Do you see the mark in the chest? So one it talks about is to represent the Indians collectively. The other is to represent the British, by extension, settler society peoples that were coming here. Their outbound hands are grasping the image of what is understood as a silver covenant chain of peace and friendship. That the British described it as this silver chain, that they wanted the friendship to be so strong that it would be like silver, that it could be polished to be renewed from time to time. We just don't make friends and then forget about it. We go back over and over and over again to honor the friendship and to polish the tarnish away from that friendship. William Johnson talked about that it, the two main forts in the east and the two main forts in the west, we are going to place a dish or a bowl, that the king's Indian allies should never be for want. Anytime they need anything, all you need to do is come and ask and you'll be supplied for. We see a fifth image down at the end, which we understand today as Johnson Hall, Sir William Johnson's personal home, where he did a tremendous amount of political, economic, military business. With the British, we also see the introduction of numbers, the 17 and the 64. And we see the pattern sort of run off one end and then run off this end as well. And so then what we began to learn from an elder down at Six Nations was this. Give me a second. If we could stand this wampum up in a circle, and if we could bring the ends together and weave the fringe together and draw the ends of the wampum together, we would see that the two diamond forms complete each other. Diamonds are a council fire for a nation, and we see that those council fires are then joined. And in the words of Sir William Johnson, attributed to Sir William Johnson, 
that the Silver Covenant chain of peace and friendship will continue to exist for as long as the sun shines, for as long as the grass is green, for as long as the rivers flow, for as long as the British wear red coats. When we look around today, we think that's probably all still happening, right? And so for our settler society, neighbors, relatives, and friends that are gathered here with us this evening, the point that I like to make with this particular wampum, this is your wampum. Do you understand that? That this was the wampum that was presented on your behalf in entering into relationship with indigenous peoples here. A silver covenant chain of peace and friendship. With that comes privileges and rights, but with that also comes responsibility. So we know we've been holding on to our end of the chain for a very long time. And so we need to understand that are, are you still holding on to your end of the silver covenant chain? It's a question that we ask. This is your wampum. You have a history of wampum. No matter how long your families have been here, from wherever they came from, this is part of your world as much as it is a part of our world. We'll take a look at this one, which is uh, another significant wampum. IGS, it took a long time for folks to figure out who IGS was. But we see the two human forms again, and they're holding hands, hands of cooperation, hands of working together. This is the John Graves Simcoe wampum belt of 1794. John Graves Simcoe was the first Lieutenant Governor of Upper Canada, a representative of the British, and it was his goal to remake Upper Canada in the form of Great Britain. And so one of his big tasks that he took on was to rename everything. So if you take a look at a map of central and southern Ontario today, if you have some time, that's your homework, maybe. We'll send you with homework. Go look at a map and pick out all the places that have names derived from Britain. And that was part of what he wanted to do. In 1808, this wampum comes and it is presented in a council down in Amherstburg, Ontario, so close to where Windsor, Ontario is today. And the Lieutenant Governor of Upper Canada in those days was Francis Gore. And they had made some decisions on the government side that had burned the relationship with Indigenous peoples in that part of the territory. And they needed to renew the friendship. They needed First Nations peoples to be a buffer between Upper Canada and the Americans on the other side of the lake. Because there were these simmering conflicts that went back to shortly after Fort Niagara in the time of 1776 when the rebellion begins and the 13 colonies kick the British out of what is now United States. And so ever since that time, there was this boiling kind of simmering conflict between the British on the north side of the lakes and the Americans on the south side of the lakes that used to be British, but were now Americans. And so it was absolutely essential for the British to have indigenous peoples as allies. So after they kind of fumbled and burned the relationship, Lieutenant Governor had to go back and stand up in council and they presented this wampum to try and renew the chain of friendship. Again, we see the two human forms and what Francis Gore speaks about is that they want that relationship to be so close, so tight, that it would be as though our hearts are joined in the middle as one. We don't know what this wampum looks like. We have a speech from a particular council that takes place in 1810. And the British have traveled down into what is today kind of the Ohio Valley region. And in council, they stand up with the nation of that territory, which is the Shawnee Nation. And they've gone to them to ask them for their help. Remember the, the simmering conflicts and trying to recruit people to the British side in case this thing boils over with the 13 colonies and all that sort of thing. And they go and they ask for the help of the Shawnee. And this Shawnee war chief stands up in council and he says to the British, you don't have to ask for our help because you already did. Shortly after you laid the French on their back, you came to us with this wampum 
that one end of the wampum darker than the other, representing the Indian end. There is a hand on either side reaching out in help and support, and again with our heart joined as one in the middle. That this was the wampum that you brought to us when you asked us for our help the first time. So you don't have to ask again, because we still have this wampum. And we think that this is the first time that the British in council encounter the one we know today as Tecumseh. Because he's the one that stands up and provides this speech and pulls out this wampum. That in 1810, if it was presented when the French were laid on their back, happened in the late 1750s. By the time the British bring this belt the first time, early 1760s, it may even have been Sir William Johnson who was very, very prolific in the distribution of wampum in trying to form relationship with indigenous nations. But in 1810, Tecumseh says, you don't have to ask us again because you already did. And we still are living up to the things that we agreed to through accepting wampum all those years ago. So we don't know exactly what it looks like. That's an interpretation from the lecture that he gives. We do have that historical record. So that brings us up to 1810. So we know through the uh, historical record that at the outbreak of the War of 1812, we find this document, and it can be found today in the archives of Ontario in the papers of the Reverend John Strawn. And it's from a former fur trader that had been hired by the British to be an Indian agent. And he was stationed at St. Joseph's Island in northern Ontario. And he provides an inventory. And on that inventory, he lists by community and by territory 10,000 indigenous warriors that are loyal to the British at the outbreak of the War of 1812. This is really, really important, I think, for our consideration. Because at the outbreak of the War of 1812, there were 6,000 British troops in all of Upper and Lower Canada. 4,400 of those were kept at Quebec City because the British felt if they lost Quebec City, they would lose the rest of the St. Lawrence and all the Great Lakes. So everything else had to fall subordinate to Quebec City. That left this guy we spoke of named Brock General Brock, with 1,600 men to defend a borderland that went from Montreal down to Niagara Falls, to Windsor, Detroit, to Sault Ste. Marie, and around to Michilimackinac. An impossible task to defend and supply that borderland with 1,600 men. But Brock goes immediately, not just having 1,600 men, but to 11,600 men because of those 10,000 warriors. Now, for the Americans, they're deathly afraid of Indians in the forest. And in their own military documents, they estimate that one Indian in the forest is the equal of three trained, outfitted, experienced American military personnel. That you need to bring th three Americans for every Indian. I did a presentation about a year ago for DND. Department of National Defense, and they still use that ratio today. So for Brock, it's not like he goes, he, it's not like he has like 1,600 men and not even 11,600 men. But the Americans would need to bring 30, 1,600 men, soldiers, just to have an equal fighting force. And those 10,000 warriors are on both the north side of the imaginary line and the southern side of the imaginary line, and they are distributed all across that borderland. 10,000 warriors. I think that's important to understand. And at the end of the War of 1812, the British come back, and they present this final wampum. It's called the Pledge of the Crown. And in the negotiations with the Americans, all of your interests were taken care of which was not true. And we want you to return to your homes, to live in peace with the Americans, to bury your weapons, to learn how to become farmers and speak English and become good Christians. 
And this is kind of what the relationship will look like moving forward after today after the War of 1812, which ends late in 1814, but it takes three months for the letter to get here, right? The document to get here from Europe where the peace was signed. This takes place in Burlington, Ontario. There are about 12 or 14 different indigenous nations there. It is passed into the hands of the Mohawk nation with the instruction that they are to carry it around to all the nations indigenous nations that are the king's Indian allies and to carry the message that came with it about the peace, the pledge of the crown. Can you find your way through that relationship? Right? 200 years earlier, when it was up to indigenous peoples, one group of indigenous peoples in the eastern woodland to define the relationship between themselves and the newcomers. It looked like that. 200 years later, it looks like this. And I think one of the things that is really, really important for us to understand as indigenous peoples is that it's another change time for us. And something happens where we go from being nation to nation allies, grasping our end of the Silver Covenant chain of peace and friendship. And we go from being nation to nation allies to the Indian problem. And all of the things that come with being the Indian problem. All of the legislation that comes trying to get rid of the Indian problem. And everything else that happens in our experience here in this land as indigenous peoples that maybe most of us are familiar with, but the loss of land, the loss of language, the loss of culture, residential school, on and on and on and on. I mean, there's a lot of really, really difficult histories to talk about, but I think it starts here. So we know now that we're in this time of reconciliation. And so which path will we choose in moving forward with reconciliation? I mean, it's up to each one of us. We all have our own mind. We can all decide and think for ourselves. But maybe there's an idea that kind of looks like that. And there's an idea that kind of looks like that. And we can choose which one we want to pursue which one we want to participate in, which one we want to teach the generations following behind us in our footsteps about how the world might be for them moving forward. <laughs>